Welcome to the Core Concepts Lecture Series. In this series of lectures, it's a wide variety of Christian faiths, but a very wide variety of non-Christian faiths as well. And we have had on this show uh, Kimpo Rinpoche, who is a Tibetan monk. And the lady who brought him to us is our guest today, Candia Ludi. And uh, in this show, we're really interested in what has brought people along, what path has brought them where they are. Uh, so we ask them to tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it, or how did they come to that belief system, uh, and how is it manifesting in their lives. And uh, Candia was, has been responsible, she bought the property originally, and was responsible for the establishment of the Pema Carpo uh, Meditation Center. This is now a nonprofit company, a Buddhist uh, church, and uh, Kenpo Repoche is there for meditations on Friday night and classes on Sunday. So welcome to the show, uh, Candy. I'm very pleased to have you with us. And I'm pleased to be here. Very tell, tell us a little bit about uh, the how you came to establish the, the Prima Carpo Meditation Center. I'd be glad to. Um, well, it was, I moved to Memphis in 1997, moved here, um, had lived in West Memphis actually for a couple of years. And, um, and so uh, when I moved to Memphis, I had been practicing Buddhism since I was in my about 30, 1980 was when I was first introduced to Buddhism. And, um, but I moved to Memphis. And I um, bought a house that had a very large um, den on the back of it. It was perfect for a meditation center. And so uh, I opened it up and we had four groups meeting there on different nights. Um, but they were small and I missed having holidays. So I started going to a Vietnamese temple for the holidays because I enjoyed them greatly and it was fun and the food was good. <laughs> but I went often to this one that was out in um, the Raleigh Fraser area of Memphis and across the chain link fence from this was this little house and I could tell it had several acres of land and so I would often look across the hedges at uh, the um, house and think what a great meditation center it would make because it was next door to these Tibetan Buddhists, I mean, Vietnamese Buddhists, and that it would make a wonderful center. And years I looked at that house. <laughs> <laughs> and the Vietnamese, as I got to know them better, because in 2003, we did a first project with them, uh, a group of Western Buddhist students, and the Vietnamese built a stupa, a stupa of enlightenment. and. Uh, a stupa is a sculptural piece, I think you would say, an outdoor sculptural piece, but it is, according to Tibetan Buddhism, it grounds enlightened energy uh, on our planet, on the city it's built in, and that, as I often describe it, it's as though it is a nuclear radiation plant of enlightened energy that has no containment field. So it's always radiating, it's radiating uh, love and joy and compassion and equanimity. So after we did that, we were very close friends. It took two months to build this. We had um, Tibetan uh, Rupeshes come, build it, we built it with them. I kept looking at that house. <laughs> looked at that house and looked at that house. And um, the Vietnamese kept saying, you should try to buy that house. You should try. Mm -hmm. I think they'd sell. And then I did um, sell the house I was in, and there was some extra money, and I needed a place to live, and so I approached them, and they accepted my offer. And because I said, well, this is my life, and this is what I love to do, and why would I rent or buy a house if I could buy a place to have a meditation center? And that was in 2005, in the spring. 
Now, for many, many years, I've worked closely with Shambhala International, which is a Western Buddhist lineage based in Tibetan Buddhism for the main part, but a Western lineage in English. Um, and oh, Shambhala? Shambhala. Shambhala. Yeah. And uh, I worked with, I've been a Shambhalian, and I've worked with Shambhala, and I coordinated programs in the summer at um, Rocky Mountain uh, Shambhala Center in Colorado. And that summer, when I was out working, I found out that um, the head of the lineage, Sakyong Nipon Rinpoche, who has some very good books out, I would recommend, that he was looking for a place uh, for this Kempo Gaon Rinpoche. Now, I did not know him that well. I had met him the summer before when he first came to the West, to America. But I had heard about him for years. And I trust this teacher, Sakyong Nipon, completely. And he had spoken about him for years and years. We heard about this Kembo that he knew very well and worked with when he was in India studying. So I just took a leap of faith and worked hard on a letter explaining that a center had been purchased or a house and land had been purchased to become a center and that we had support of the Vietnamese Buddhist temple next door and that Memphis did not have a teacher like him here, that Buddhism was new to the whole area, and that there were students who were interested, and it would be a good place for him, and it would be a place that needed a teacher. And so he said, you know, and then I promised that I would do everything I could to make it a good situation for him. And he knew me. So he said, sounds good, Candia, sounds good. <laughs> and so I uh, so I had a meeting with the Kempo. He said, why don't you go down and check out Memphis, see how you feel about it. <laughs> and he came and he went for two years. And he found he did have students that um, he felt a connection with. And he, he felt it was auspicious and that it was good. And so after he finished his um, time and his agreements, they had a meeting together and uh, decided that yes, it would be good if he had his own seat of activities, his own center. And so he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to Memphis. Mm -hmm. And that's how Femme Carpo began. Yeah. And so this is his seat. Uh, he, is, he is the founder of Pemo Carpa. You know, I was, uh, had the good fortune to, to be in the right place at the right time and to have enough guts to... To be, the, to be the catalyst. Yes, to bring a real teacher here. And then, as I say, he felt it was very auspicious, and, and so it's his center. Now he has... Uh, now we have had Kimpo... Is it Kimpo Kimpo, 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 Kimpo. We've, mm -hmm. we've had him on the Bookman Show, we've had him on Core Concepts yes. Lectures. And uh, but it was it, I thought it would be interesting to know a little bit more about your path and how you came to the point. Now we have uh, a lot of people from different religions. Some of them are spiritual leaders, head of those organizations, and some are not. Uh, some are just um, you know ex it, they they've gone through a process of moving from one thing to another in their lives. Their their path has taken them in many places. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit about yours. And we'll get back to Kim for it in a little okay. later. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I kind of reached the end there from at the beginning. <laughs> so I was raised in Arkansas. And I would hear about meditation, mainly TM. But there was no way to really experience it. But every time I'd hear about meditation from various places, it, it caught my interest. Mm. I was interested in it. I didn't know very much about it, but I was interested. And then um, my husband and I, um, he worked for Catholic Police Services. And we were doing a second tour, and we were going to Tanzania. And they, they suggested that we take, uh, prepare a shipment, because we'd be there three years. And so I bought books, because they had said there aren't books. Um, you need to bring things to read, you need to bring many things. So this is backwoods of Tanzania, it's not in a major city. Oh, we were in a major city, we were, we were in Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam. But at that time, 
now thankfully looking back in hindsight because this was 1980 that uh, that was the, the depths of Tanzania's problems uh, there were shortages everything mm -hmm. was in short supply so off we went we were doing maternal child health had many many programs all over the countryside but in that shipment I I tend to pick out books. I say they twinkle at me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just kind of go through the shelves. And there they are. And I pull them out. And I ordered from uh, the Whole Earth catalog. Some people may remember it. Uh, and various places, used bookstores. So in that shipment were three now very important books, but I didn't know it. I picked out books to take. And there was Meditation and Action and Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogim Trumper Rinpoche and Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And uh, another one on the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And I read those books over and over again. And because my husband was very young. We were young. We were in our 20s. And he was the youngest director I think Catholic Relief Services has ever had in the country. And there was big problems. And so he had a lot to do and it was very stressful. And I was his support system. So what was going to support me? <laughs> and I read these books, especially Meditation and Action, because that's what I needed. And I found they worked. I found that it was true, at least for me, what these teachings were saying about meditation and about being mindful and aware and about uh, trying to stay open to all the situations and, and trying to be compassionate. And that's where it started. <laughs> right there in Tanzania, me reading them over and over and over again. And then, you know, I, we came back and I read and I read. And it's the funniest thing. You would say it's karma. Hmm. But I never thought about these teachers I was reading as being alive and having centers and that, you know, I could go find them and I could study with them and things like that. It never occurred to me. I was living in New York City, no less. And then one day I was reading Shambhala, the Sacred Path of the Warrior, once again in my kitchen, which is my favorite place to sit and read in this little apartment. It was the quietest place. And I realized in the back of the book was a list of centers. And there was definitely one in New York City. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so I started going. I started going there. And um, I was particularly taken with Shambhala training, which was this idea of warrior in the world and creating enlightened society. And so, um, after I had gone to both the meditation sessions and I had taken some of the levels of, of weekend trainings and such, I thought, this feels right. This feels like the way I should go. But I need to make sure. So I um, said, let me go to one of their retreat centers. Let me stay a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. Then I'll know. You know, I'll know if this is cold, if this is weird, or if this is right for me. And so I moved to a place in Vermont, Carmichulin, which is their retreat center. And I stayed for three months. And then I said, you know, my money's running out. <laughs> and they said, why don't you just stay and we'll put you on staff. And so I stayed for two years. Now, is that, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with something called Shambhala Reiki. I wonder if that comes from him. Or I don't think so. It may be one of his students, but it doesn't come directly from Shambhala International. No, because I know that. But that's how it started. Um, I lived there uh, for two years. 89 and 90. Now, was your husband still with the... Well, see, this was what was so interesting, how it opened up. He was now with um, Save the Children. 
and he had been hired to set up their maternal child health programs, right? And so he's traveling. He's traveling almost all the time, going all over, from country to country, setting up these programs. So what he would do when he'd come home on leave is he'd come immediately to Carmen Chole because he said, this is great. <laughs> Just I need a meditation center. And he's a really good cook. He likes to get up early. So he would work in the kitchen, do the breakfast shift. They loved him. <laughs> yeah, he would come and stay there. So between going out and coming and going out and coming, then he would come and stay at the meditation center. So there wasn't much problem as far as moving from Catholic relief fund or, or Catholicism to Buddhism? Oh, I was not raised Catholic. Now, he was raised Catholic. Definitely Italian Catholic, but uh, and still is. But no, um, I definitely you know Catholic Relief Services is the um, the arm of the Catholic Church that does charity and humanitarian aid, and they are very ecumenical. They help everyone, and if I can put a plug in for Catholic Relief Services, <laughs> I know from you know experience they're very good. If you're not sure about a disaster or something like that, you're not sure who to give to, you can trust them. They do a good job and they don't, they don't you know, they're there to help. So during that two years, you pretty much fully embraced Buddhism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I did. We uh, practiced five hours a day and worked in the afternoons, had classes at nights. And so I was able to explore it deeply. Now there are a lot of different uh, people may not be aware of this, but uh, there are different types of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Memphis, we have some that are sort of half Taoist and half Buddhist. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Vietnamese Buddhists, mm -hmm. which would be what, Mariana? Are they? They're, they're, they're Mahayana Buddhists. Mahayana. Um, they're often called the Pure Land. No, the combination of Pure Land and Zen. Mm -hmm. Because they do have sitting meditation, uh, but the focus of most of the practice is on the Buddha Amitabha. And that's where the Pure Land name comes uh, that people often use as a, a label. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is the Buddha Amitabha, upon reaching Buddhahood, and which is a, a vastness of mind, a powerful, open, clear mind, um, a, a knowing of the nature of how things are so completely, that Buddhas manifest uh, realms. This is a realm. We live in a realm. And we live in a, certainly in a realm here in Memphis. <laughs> but his realm is called the land of great bliss, uh, Dewa Chen or Sukhavati. And he said that when you die, if you can remember me, if you remember me, if you remember I have a place, and you remember my mantra, any part, if you can remember, then you will be reborn there. Now would that mantra be the one that I was quoting to you the other day on the phone, uh, that uh, I'm not sure I can do it, I haven't had it, I haven't been doing it, but I had quoted, I read it to you, and you were reading it, you were talking to me back again. It was, it was the one that's in uh, Kim uh, Rinpoche's first book. Omani Padme Hum. That is the, actually the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of Compassion. The Mani mantra, as it's most well known, because it is the mantra of Tibet. That is the mantra that's carved on hillsides, rocks, said all the time. Om Amitabhaya uh, Each of them have a mantra. Uh, I'll tell you a great story that, sure. that comes, I believe, from the Kempo's book. Now this is, I work in that this is a new book by Kempo Rinpoche. Your mind is your teacher. And uh, I should say that you have Buddhist priests who work in particular places, but Kenpo Rinpoche is, uh, is an intellectual. He's here actually uh, translating from the... Uh, from Tibetan into English. Uh, Kenpo Gama Rinpoche, I'll just segue and then come back to my story because you'll love it. Um, he is a, his title is Kenpo. And Kempo is a PhD in Buddhist studies. It's the highest degree, scholarly degree, that can be given within the, um, particularly within the Nyingma and Kagyu, they're four main schools of Tibetan Buddhism, 
if you're familiar with the Gendo tradition, it's a geshe. Um, so he, he is, it's not just given. He has nine years of study, and then he was required to do three years of teaching. But to receive it, you uh, may finish the nine years, but you also have to show that you have internalized it, because these are practice lineages. Uh, that you have internalized it, that you have these qualities, and that you would make a good teacher. And so upon that, so often a class may have one or two or maybe three people from it who would then be given the degree. So Kempo is his title. Mm -hmm. His name, Gawang, means powerful joy. And Rinpoche is an honorific. It literally means precious one. And what they're precious with um, is a clear mind and all this knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they're highly appreciated. I think it's in the book. But I was lucky enough to be able to help. I was uh, his hands in working on this book. Uh, we translated, we transcribed many, many talks as the basis of it that he gave with translators. And then they were all put together. And so I had the pleasure of working my fingers a lot on the computer. One of the stories in here, um, it was from his father, who was imprisoned for many years after in the, I guess it's the 60s. Now this is in Tibet, imprisoned by the Chinese yes. government. And he was rooming with an old lama. You know, that's an interesting thing of karma. But many people were put into these prisons and they were physically, uh, it was harsh. They were. It was a prison of the worst kind. They were beaten. They were hungry. They had bad things done to them. But they were placed in these tight quarters with these very realized beings because they put all of the main Rinpoche's into prison. So many people had the opportunity that they would never have had in real life to be in a very hard situation with realized teachers who guided them, who led them, who took them through the teachings and were an example. So many people came out of these prisons 5, 10, 15, 20 years highly realized because of it. So, you know, they have a view of these were my friends. <laughs> They gave me the opportunity to burn bad karma and to study and to practice and to put it into action in a way that could never have occurred, which is kind of a rare view. <laughs> so one night, the man in the room across from him called out to the teacher, Rinpoche, Rinpoche, I'm dying. What do I do? What do I do? I'm dying. And the teacher called back through the wall. Remember the Buddha Amitabha. He's red and he's in the West. Mm -hmm. So I've always felt that that's the, just the pith, sharp arrow point of the teachings. When you die, go West and head for the red. Head for the red. Head for the red. And what does the red mean? Beautiful, brilliant red color. Mm -hmm. The Buddha Amitabha manifests as red light. Apparently incredibly brilliant, powerful, just red light. And it's in the West. So that's the pith instructions. <laughs> You're talking about the Buddha Amitabha. If you can't remember anything else, just when you're dead and you know you're dead, just stop and don't run and don't let fear take over. After all, I say to people who are dying them with, remember, you're dead. What can happen to you? You're dead. You know, it's a mental body. You have a body, but it's a mental body. It cannot be harmed. So turn to the west and look for the red. Turn to the west and look for the red. And, and if you can remember the... If you can remember it, that's Buddha Amitabha. 
And if you can remember um, his mantra, if you can remember uh, as many things, and, day watch and... Can you repeat for the viewers the Buddha Amitambha's uh, Om mantra? Om Amitabhaya Pri. Mm. Om Amitabhaya Pri. H-R-I-H. Pri. And I know I'm not pronouncing it quite correctly. And, and its meaning? It's calling on the Buddha Amitabha. You are naming... I'm coming. Help! <laughs> Help! <laughs> what uh, that he he was involved in a um, another book. Did you finish the story? The yes. segue. Yes. The uh, mm -hmm. they, he wrote a book earlier that I have a copy of, and I was looking at some of those um, uh, mantras and so forth in mm -hmm. there. That's what I was talking to mm -hmm. you about on the phone. Um, but this one is is uh, is it. This is more of the teaching in this book. I I rec you know prejudice, yes, I admit it right here. Mm -hmm. But I recommend this book very, very much. Um, there are two two main types of meditation. There is a contemplative or analytical meditation where you use your mind, where you think about things. And you, you think about them as deeply as you can. Focus your concentration. Focus your concentration on them. Study material about it. Think about it. And then when you have realization, when you have an understanding, when you, when you, if you have an aha. Or epiphany, whatever. Yeah, or just you've studied enough that you can, you're experiencing it you can feel it. At that time it's good to drop the thinking about it and just sit there with it. And then when it fades away, I start thinking about it again. So that's analytical meditation and there are many things to think about. And it can and, be something very simple like a candle or a... Well no, that, that's more of a kind. concentration. Yeah, it could be that. In a way that would fall under analytical. Mm -hmm. Although we often think about those as being used within the resting meditation where you are learning to um, focus your mind and let your thoughts dissolve. Yeah, could we have a sample or give us an example of something that one might concentrate on? Like maybe the idea of God or what, what would you... If you were, if you were, um, if you were Christian, certainly, certainly. You could, uh, although God is not conceptual, so that might be a little hard to think about. Um, we might think about omnipresence. Yes. Or some aspect that he's given. You could. Mm -hmm. You could. Um, you could think about what is compassion. What is love and kindness? What is love? You know, when they say God is love. You could think about it. And you may have texts that you read, or you be reading for a while, and then you would think about I, what I tend you just to go into read. I tend to go into meditation when I'm reading something that gets my attention and then I go then, off. <laughs> See, you're doing contemplative meditation. Yeah. Then you're allowing the thinking to become... Meditation in Tibetan mean, means to become familiar. So you are becoming familiar with something. And as your mind becomes more and more familiar with it, uh, it's like someone you love. You look at them. You look at them. You may look at pictures of them. You look at them. And when you want to, you can call them to mind in detail. You know what they look like. You know how they sound. You know everything about them. You are familiar. And it's the same. We become familiar. And in the case of meditation, you're becoming familiar with your own mind. So. In contemplative meditation, in particular in this, there are four main areas. Multiplicity, meaning everything is made up of parts. And those parts are made up of parts, and those parts are made up of parts. We think things are whole and we label them, we name them. Chair, me, book. But really, if you think about it, where in this, is a book. There's no book here. It's a name. 
It's a conceptual designation. It's a label. But we take those labels as existing, and then we layer all sorts of stuff on them. Then we become attached to them, or we don't like them, or they're this, or they're that. Or we recommend them. Or we recommend them highly. <laughs> <laughs> but we still, we, we glob stuff on to things that if we actually take it apart, it's not there. It's a conceptual label. And that sounds very dry and boring until somebody does something that makes you so angry you can barely breathe. And then there it is and you're stuck with it. And you bring it up in your mind and you work it over and over. This, that, this, that, should have said this, didn't say that. But, and it can go on for years. It's a really it relative relative consciousness, kind of a regurgitation there. Mm -hmm. It makes you miserable. Makes you miserable, makes them miserable. Well, really, if you look at it, first off, where are these two beings? And this book, you know, covers how you really take yourself apart enough so you begin to see that there's nothing singular, there's nothing permanent, there's nothing that doesn't change, isn't always changing. First law of Buddha, everything changes. Everything changes. I like the second one even better. And all of our problems come from resistance to that change. It's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. You know, when you think about it, we resist things we can't do anything about. And then we long for things we can't do anything about. You say, you know, we pull to us and we push away. Passion, aggression, and ignorance. And we refuse to admit how things are. So, so that's the first one. And multiplicity and then impermanence, which we've just gone into. Mm -hmm. Impermanence, things are always changing, which means that the person that I got mad at two weeks ago is not the same person, and neither am I. <laughs> neither am I. And, neither, and the situation does not exist because the past is gone. Present is here. Future is not here. Past is not here. Why are we in either one of those two places? That's what meditation, now resting meditation works a lot on synchronizing body and mind in the present moment. We are only alive now. A series of nows is when we're alive. When everything's happening. The others two, they don't exist. Except, you know, when we're to get tight in our minds, keep going in the now. So, multiplicity, impermanence, suffering. Suffering can also be translated in many ways. And one of them is dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction. We are never able to rest. There's always this kind of go all the time. Agitation. Oh, it's just always moving, moving, moving. And we cause a lot of our own suffering. Because again, we're not accepting just what's going on. And accepting what's going on doesn't mean you even agree with it or that you condone it. It's just accepting it. We get rid of a lot of stuff by doing that. Have a little humor. And then nirvana or peace, meaning there is a path and there is a way and we can come to know our own mind. And our own mind is marvelous. Our own mind is good. It is peaceful. It is completely peaceful. And that we can know because that's who we are. See, because Buddhists believe in basic goodness. They believe that all of this exists out of confusion, out of an ignorance about who and what we are, how things really are. There's the how it appears and how it is, or the relative and the absolute. But that absolute, the relative has no permanent, it's a dream, it's a fog, it's a misunderstanding. And that when that's gone, just like you wake up from a bad dream, this is all gone too. Because our nature is basically wonderful and good, it's wisdom and compassion. Now that second form of meditation 
non-contemplative mm -hmm. is is uh, to achieve uh, a withdrawal, or what is what is? How would you go about that? No, oh no, definitely. Um, that's resting. That's what most people call meditation, sitting, shamatha, shine, zen, all these names, resting meditation. Resting meditation um, from the Mahayana Buddhist point of view, right? Mm -hmm. We do everything so that we can wake up, so that we can be of greater benefit to all sentient beings. So there is this, I have to get myself in the best shape possible, which is enlightened, if possible, you know, as soon as possible. I have to, I have to cut through my own confusion. I have to see that I am wisdom and compassion and what that really is, not just words. I have to experience it, and then it needs to become stable, not just flashes. That's the best way to help others. So. I may sit for hours and appear like that's all I'm doing. But by having this motivation, the whole idea is that you would become more and more skillful so that you can be more and more helpful and you can do it well. Not this kind of, you know, help that occurs that makes things worse. That isn't what people really need. That it doesn't bring a lesson into suffering. So we sit so we can be of greater benefit to all beings. And then, you know, we're all beings, so. <laughs> what is the technique for that second one? If, the, if you can, if there is a technique. Sure there is. There are. You're synchronizing body, speech, and mind in the present moment. Now, if we take a good seat, which I just unslouched a little bit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it is, is physical. You want to have a straight spine, if possible. You want to have your limbs and your body upright and open and breath and blood and everything can go through your body smoothly. And, you know, there's a difference in your feeling if you sit up and if you slouch, too. You can feel that um, kind of psychologically. You want to have an open chest and a kind of firm upright back. And this is, in a way, signifying how we are. We're open. We are not closed off. We are opening up more and more. The breath is my favorite to offer to people as an object of meditation because it's always with you. So let's use it as an example, but you could use a picture. You could use a candle. You could use a mantra. You could use a rock. You could use anything because what you want is you want to have a focal point, and I use the breath because it's always with us, and it is there but not there, and it is important to life. But you want a focal point because then you know when you leave that focal point, when your mind is gone, when you're not in the room, when you're not aware that your body's in the room and that you are breathing. So I'm using breath as, or you're looking at the rock, or you're looking at the stand. when you know and you're back in that moment because you're aware that you were thinking about dinner and not even, you know, present. Mm -hmm. Then the technique that is so important is you stay with your object of meditation. Don't follow the meal plan. Stay as long as you can. Because we're training our mind to be able to stay with something present for as long as we want it to, whatever subject. And when we want it to stop, we're also training it to do that, which most all of us know there have been times and states of mind and trains of thoughts that have gone over and over enough time that you'd like to drop it. So we sit, we relax, we breathe deeply, slowly and completely, in and out, whatever your object of meditation is, and then stay with that. Gently but firmly stay with it. When you leave, come back to it. 
for as long as the session time you have picked, whether it's five minutes or five hours, it doesn't matter. Just keep doing it over and over and over again. Keep coming back and staying. And that actually, it's a very simple but hard to do technique of meditation. Now there's two sessions. Uh, there's one on Friday mm -hmm. in which uh, he leads the meditation or yes. he's there. He's, he's not, there. He's not okay. saying anything, but he's, mm -hmm. he's there. And uh, I've noticed that uh, periodically there is the ringing of the chime. Is mm -hmm. that to wake people up or what is the purpose of that mm -hmm. intermittent thing? That's, we do that every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Because truthfully, we have, most of our people are new. And to ask people to sit for an hour is hard. Uh, so every 20 minutes, ding. And at that time then, people may move. Because we have people who move from a cushion to a chair. I noticed that. Or from a chair to a cushion. I noticed that as well. Sure. And also if you need to move your body around. You know, I have problems with one leg. It just goes completely to sleep. Especially in the last 20 minutes. You know, I, I really try to be careful because I can't stand up. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's to move around. As we say is, if your body is hurting, then shift and move to make yeah. yourself more comfortable. If your mind is hurting, stay still. Uh, I, in my, in, in my case, I noticed it, but I continued. I never moved. I didn't think anything about it. You I mean, it, it just, I noticed it, but it did draw me. Uh -huh. And so I was wondering if there was some uh, purpose of that in, in addition. Well, Thich Nhat Hanh, he, um, they call in, in his tradition the, the mindfulness bell. Mm -hmm. And it's often rung. Uh, it will be rung just at random. And now, might better time. mention for the viewers, Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese Buddhist who was a leader even during the war. Yes, yes. And um, and I don't know about the one next door, the, the Vietnamese Buddhist mm -hmm. next door, but the one that's on um, uh, Goodlet mm -hmm. near Winchester is very, I know that some very of... Very closely connected. I know that some of the, in fact, the one, the 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 monk that I was talking to mostly was it ended up being called to stay with him in San Diego for some time. Wonderful. So he left. So, uh, ah. uh, but he might. I just wanted them to know who Thich Nhat Hanh is in, in case they didn't know. Well, that. I would recommend his books. Uh, he is very clear. He has uh, 40, 50 books, maybe more, in English. And he is one of the older uh, teachers who. His choice. When he came, he came to a peace conference in France, I believe, in, during the Vietnam War, and was uh, strongly not invited to return mm -hmm. to Vietnam. So his was not by choice necessarily. But in coming out to the West, then he uh, has been teaching all these many years, and is a, a very clear uh, teacher of, of Buddhism, particularly in the West, and is one of these teachers who came and stayed, and has been working very closely with how to teach uh, Buddhism. I never in looked in, in the West. I really didn't look into what his activity was in Vietnam, but I arrived there in August of 66, and it was just just prior to my arrival when they, one of them uh, burned himself to death, and in fact we had pictures of this thing. Yes. It, was, uh, it was something else. So they were, the, the Buddhists were very politically active in Vietnam at that time. And uh, my understanding, and this is my understanding, I say that, is that uh, part of what caused so much trouble uh, with Thich Nhat Hanh was that he and his monks and nuns said, you know, our job is to help. We're here to help hungry, we're here to help injured, we're here to help the sick. And we're not asking whose side they're on. We're not taking sides. Our job is to help. And the government looked as uh, helping the enemy if, if uh, you... Neither one yeah. agreed with that one. Mm -hmm. You know, that's somewhat of a governmental, often a governmental stance. It's, you're either for me or against me. Mm -hmm. That ability to look beyond and understand, particularly when you consider monastics, that have the way of peace as their, uh, I think we can say even Christians, that is their uh, vows. Their vows are to be of service, to be helpful. And in a way, I think we have to hold them to a greater good 
Now, is there is there a uh, a hierarchy? I mean, I know that um, uh, Kimpo Rinpoche is is is. Um, talked about uh, the Dalai Lama and we've had the Dalai Lama in Memphis and I think he saw him there yes, and talked with him yes, there. Uh, is, is there a hierarchy that actually uh, answers to him that, that is connected down through? I mean, where would Kenpo come into that hierarchy or, or either the one that you worked with in Vermont? Um, well, he is a non -drawing. Kempa and uh, Namjuling Monastery in South India was started by His Holiness Panarimshe. Uh, he is Nyingma, which is one of the four main schools of Tibetan Buddhism. And so his root teacher, uh, His Holiness Panarimshe, um, who died now in 2009, uh, that is his root teacher, and to him he says he owes everything because of his goodness, because of his blessings, because he set up a monastery and a Buddhist college that young uh, men like him could go to. And if they uh, were monastic and if they kept the rules, everything was paid for. I mean, he had often one set of robes, and the food wasn't that good. But as he says, the teachings, was they were so precious and wonderful and freely given. He, he often talks because he's been here now long enough and he's, he knows his karma is, and his teacher sent him to the West. So, yes, His Holiness Panarimpoche told him, you go West. And he was, but, um, you know, he's, he remembers how he was trained and the joy and the friendliness and the desire on the teacher's part and on the students both, that everyone learns. And he finds often this more adversarial relationship, the, the always grading, the always judging, as opposed to um, helping people to understand, training people in the knowledge they need, but doing it. You know, if someone needs help, then the teacher and the other students all are right there. Does he ever talk about um um, I don't know if they did the Zen style or not, but where they debated and discussed it. Did he ever talk about this much? <laughs> Kempo, Kempo, when he graduated, Kempo Kowam, when he graduated, was the top debater at Namjuan. He is an amazing debater. And I can see it in him that he enjoys a good question. Mm -hmm. He likes questions. His eyes start to sparkle. And you could just watch him kind of <laughs> and he's ready, you know, there's this sparkle and this smile and he's got a very keen intellect and he thinks fast and he's got a good sense of humor. But yes, they debate hours every day because that's how they work together to learn. Now, they took he, all these different sides all together. Does he employ that at all in the Sunday session of question and answer? And, yeah. 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 I see it in these questions and answers. Uh, not so much in these portions, because most students in our center are new. But in the questions, in the questions, he does love those good, good questions. And, and he, that, can be, he can be really clear. Uh, let's uh, give the uh, viewers an idea of, of when you have sessions there and the address and any contact numbers. Sure. Okay. Yes, we are Pema. P-E-M-A, Karpa, K-A-R-P-O. So it's www.pemacarpa.org. That's the best way. And that tells you whenever there's Everything sessions. Everything is there. Mm -hmm. okay. And also we're online. So if you can't make it to the center, uh, if you go to the front page of the website, there will be URLs and you can join us online. So we have people who are either sick or they've moved or they're traveling various reasons, children, or parents, um, so they join us online. We have Friday nights at 7 p.m. from 7 to 8. We have one hour of meditation. Then uh, Kemba Gong Rinpoche gives a talk on meditation and opens it for questions and answers. Again, on Sunday at 11, we sit for about 20 minutes, and then we chant in English. 
a set of chants. We have three sutras that we chant. We do a lineage because there is a lineage. And coming from Tibetan Buddhism, a lineage is very important because these teachings are not only written down, but they are passed from one teacher to their students. Their students have realization. The teacher is checking them. Then they become teachers, and they have students, and so on, from generation to generation. They use the texts, but this lineage of teacher to student becoming teacher to students becoming teachers. So that lineage is chanted. And the certain you know, main ones are mentioned and thanked because he is in this lineage. He is the teacher now. And as he says, he has hopes to create at least 108 teachers himself. Now, is there a, a Q&A session? Both times. At, at, in, in, in the Friday and Sunday? On the Friday and Sunday and after. He meets with people. So if you'd like to meet with him, you have some questions, or you just want to spend a little bit of time one-on-one -on, -one on Fridays and Sundays, unless he has to run for something and it's very rare. He then meets with people in his office. Right, tell us a little bit more. We've still got a few minutes. Tell us a little bit more about this book and why you recommend it so highly. I mean, what, I mean, uh, what is it about it uh, that would lead one into uh, uh, utilizing the a system of meditation or study. There is a very famous teacher who died in 2012. His name is Mipam. And he, he spent his almost his whole life in retreat. And he said that he was an emanation of wisdom, of Manjushri, which is wisdom. And he wrote these very clear commentaries on, for all the schools study them and, and he, because of his clarity and then he is held in such deep regard because of his amazing meditation. He said, you need to use contemplative or analytical meditation first. Start with that, which is easy for us as Westerners because we're raised to think the scientific method, we all know how to read. But he said, start with that because then you have the view. Then you know why you want to sit down and sit and that that will give you the strength of purpose to go through, the, especially in the beginning, we're used to moving. We move our body, we move our mouths, and we move our minds all the time. With TVs going in, we're on the internet, you know well, exactly what I'm talking about. So then suddenly to come to a complete halt, you may get your body semi-still, but the mind is just like, and there you're trying to lie. <laughs> so, if you know why you want to do it, you're more likely to sit through it. And then you've got to kind of face your stuff. Maybe you haven't looked at it. It is going to come up. And there you are sitting there, and you're going to notice it. Because meditation is not about blanking out. It's not about shoving everything out. Meditation is about being able to stay with everything. Stay with it and not move. Stay with it and not feed it, not push it away, not run from it. You're just not moved by it. You are sitting and your mind is big and it is vast and it is still and your mind, thoughts and emotions are just kind of like, you know, dancing in but, it. But you would use, would you use more than one kind at a time? In other words, uh, you started out with yeah. transcendental meditation. Which no, is, I never. I, didn't, oh. I just was interested in it. I oh, never you were, all right. it. Well, it, in in its system, there is you're using a mantra, and the idea is to not be thinking about all these things. See, quite the opposite. Yeah, but this is this is something that, that I think is very important because I hear that a lot. Meditation. Now I'm you know I'm from the Tibetan Buddhist lineage. Mm. Is that you are able to sit with everything. Nothing is pushed out. Nothing is pushed away. Nothing is hidden. But you're not following it. It's just coming up. It's there as long as it's there. And it will go away because of impermanence. That's second. Everything changes. And it's about stillness with busyness. Uh, would, would a student at Pema Carpo Center use more than one type of meditation or would they 
focus only on the contemplative or only on the no. uh, breathing? Both. For example, in a session, it would be very normal to spend, let's say we're going to do a 20 minute session, that five minutes would be spent in contemplation. I mean, you, would, you probably should start by sitting down and taking a few deep breaths and relaxing a little bit and feeling your body and being in the room. And then you can think about why am I doing this? What's my motivation? What's my reasons? So you're in the contemplative state. Uh huh. You're point. contemplating now. That's yeah. contemplating. We contemplate all the time. You know, think about what we're having for dinner. It's actually contemplation, if you think about it. It's the same. It's that use of the mind. It's not something kind of esoterically odd. We so do say it with all that the first time. with that first thing, you might shift gears and go into breathing. Yeah, let's say breathing is my focus of meditation. You also make yourself, you know, breathe with yourself. I'm really going to do it for this 15 minutes. Ding. And then you do it. And then you sit, and no matter what comes up in your mind, you know you're breathing. You've got some attention on it. You know you're in the room. You hear everything. Your senses are alert. You are really alert. You're more alert than we often are. And you keep coming back to the breath. Keep coming back to the breath. And then when the session's over, if you have a bell or if you have a timer or whatever, and it goes off, then with the final thing that we always say, and I should get this in before we quit, or I can just do it, mm -hmm. is dedication of merit. It is felt that merit is that unseen powerfulness that removes obstacles and allows good fortune to occur. That when we have good states of mind, when we do good actions of body, speech, and mind, something comes into existence, and it's called merit. And so, when you have done something meritorious, at the end you would dedicate the merit to all sentient beings. Because the only way to, to get it truly and to keep it is to give it away. And as a sentient being, of course, you're in the bucket that gets it. We've got just a few moments. Would you like to take this time to for a message to our viewers from the Prima Carpo Meditation? It is our, uh, our nature to be wise, to be genuine and compassionate, to be loving and kind, to be gentle and have a sense of humor. And that if you make the effort and have enough courage to sit and stillness and get to know yourself, no matter what is on top, when you go underneath and underneath, you will find this. And if you can come to Memphis and you're here and you would like to sit with Democarpo, but I would recommend that you find people and ways and learn to get to know yourself. Thank you very much for being with us today. We, oh, your mind is your teacher. How does one get a copy of uh, Kimpo Gowang's book? Amazon. 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 And bookstores will order it for you. It's available. It's through Shambhala Press, and it is available in. And that is anyway. K H E N P O Gowang, G A W A N G. All right. Your mind is your teacher. Thank you very much, Candia, for being with us today. That was uh, enlightening. I would have like to have gotten more into your early struggles on the thing, but it doesn't it sound like to me you kind of sailed through. But oh, no, 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 no. no, no. There. But it's been a thread that uh, I am so thankful, you know, I got hold of. Maybe we can come back and talk about that on, a, on another occasion. Thank you. I want to thank you for being with us on Core Concepts today. I want to remind you to go to our YouTube site, at Renford Broadcast Network, you'll be able to see this. You may be seeing it there to begin with, but if you're seeing this somewhere else, you can see all of the Core Concepts lectures there. Also, the Renford uh, Broadcast Network has many other things on that site, including the Laws of Material Wealth Personal Development Program, the Bookman Show, uh, the theater, movies, uh, audio books, and music with meaning. So thanks again for being with us on Core Concepts and we'll see you next week.